that long. It's not real long. So what, how long were you in the store? Well, I started, before I cut in hair, my dad was a barber. I cut in hair. Are you doing that? Yeah, I think so. She's hanging in there. She's hanging in there. She's a pretty good report from the doctor. 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 We are in John chapter 5, still, it's got a lot in here, and again, this I, I didn't run any analysis on it, but holy smokes, 
I think over half of this over half of this chapter is just Jesus talking. It's it's the portion we're going to look at today. It's got no narration in it. It's just words of Jesus, uh, which I appreciate about John. This way, John uh, John was Luther's favorite gospel for that reason. He said I mean, he, he had no, no problem with the other ones, but he loved reading John because that's where Jesus does all his preaching. It's recorded in John. Um, it's, it is, it, yeah, of course, includes the things that Jesus did, but specifically the things that Jesus said. And if he's the Word of God incarnate, it's pretty important to listen to him, I would say, right? right. So we looked at uh, last week, and you'll have to excuse my memory because it's actually not very good right now. Um, he's talking about, this is right on the heels of healing the man who was lame for 38 years the pool and then he had a big speech uh, sermon i would say after this that the father has sent him and everything that the son is doing is what the father does he's he's continually working for the recreation of the world if the father is the creator the son is also always involved in creative activity right he's the word of god by which the father creates everything is made through jesus and so now when he encounters suffering, his work is exactly what the father would do to, to remake something. And it, so the man that had been healed, the, the terminology used for it was made whole. Not just healed, but made whole. Because that all includes the forgiveness of sins. It's talking about the fact that as the father raises the dead and enlivens them, so also the son enlivens those whom he wills. Right? He's bringing life to people. What verse? Um, I'm just doing an overview of John 5 so far. We're going to be starting at 31 today. Um, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has given also to the Son to have life in himself. Moreover, authority to him to execute judgment. So Jesus himself is the one who executes judgment over the creation. It's, the Father has granted that authority to Jesus, who is both God and man, to do such things. Looking at 28, this is where we're going to get a running start into our passage today. Uh, Do not marvel at this, that an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and they will come out. So he's already said that the hour is now here where the dead will hear his voice. And that's currently, anywhere Jesus speaks, the dead hear his voice. Because what are we in our sin? Dead. Dead. But also, on the last day, those who are already dead and buried will hear his voice, and they will come out. Uh, this is the resurrection of the dead. So these are all things, too, that the Jews were familiar with. The, the Pharisees specifically did believe in a resurrection at the end of days. And Jesus is, is speaking in terms that they can actually understand here. I can do nothing on my, on my own. In other words, I, I don't do anything that the Father doesn't do. As I hear and judge, my judgment is just. For I don't seek my own will, but the, also the, it's the will of him who sent me. Here's our text today. If I give witness concerning myself, my witness is not valid. There is another that bears witness concerning me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses concerning me is valid. You have sent emissaries to John, and he has given witness to the truth. However, I do not receive that that witness from a man, but I say these things that you might be saved. He was the lamp, set alight and shining brightly, And you were willing to rejoice for a time in his light. But I have that witness which is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father has given to me that I should accomplish them, these works which I do witness concerning me, that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me, he as well, has given witness concerning me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. Nor do you have his word remaining in you, for you do not believe in him whom he has sent, this one, me." You investigate the scriptures, for you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they, however, which give witness concerning me. Yet you do not will to come to me that you may have life. That's what we've got for today. So a lot's going on here, right? Look at the beginning. What, it, what, it, what kind of language does it look like Jesus is using here in terms of witness and testimony? It's legal language. Um, in fancy terms, we call that forensic language. Um, it's, he's talking about the fact that 
he isn't tooting his own horn. Okay, if I gave witness to my concerning myself, my witness is invalid. I, he's, I'm not. I'm not saying who I am. Other every there's other things that are telling you who I am. I have a grit. I have a. There's another who bears witness concerning me, and I know that witness which he witnesses concerning me is valid. So who is he? Who do you think he's talking about there? God. His father. Yep, you're you're both right, but in different ways. <laughs> That's why it's tricky. Uh, early, some of the early church thought that he meant John, but looking at it in the bigger picture, I think that you can see later on he says, uh, I, don't re I don't receive that witness from a man. So here's the big question. Whose witness is John bearing concerning Jesus? Who gave John that witness, that testimony? Holy Spirit. Yeah, God did. So the, the witness that John bears is divine witness it's not of human origin at all yes because as you say you just talked about this huge long passage it's all jesus talking well mm -hmm. who, who remembers that word for word jesus said this and then he said this and then this. i mean that has to be the holy spirit. well that is the holy spirit yeah. but i mean john, john the baptizer is who he's talking about here well i know well, right I mean, but and then jesus says this later when we get to 14 i think uh when the when the paraclete the holy spirit comes he will bring to remembrance all the things that I've said to you. In other words, when you're going to write this down, I'm going to give you all the words that I've said now so far. Um, so not, John the Apostle is inspired. Also, John the Baptist, his witness is from the Holy Spirit. That's what a prophet is or an, or an apostle, right? They're, they're receiving the testimony that is divine, of divine origin. So it is, the, it is God's witness that even John was bearing. And in this case, uh, Jesus says, you were willing to rejoice in John's light for a time. In other words, what was their opinion about John? What was the Jews' opinion of John for a period of his ministry? Favorable or unfavorable? Favorable. Very favorable. Even the, the Jewish historian Josephus, who was not a Christian, wrote histories of the region for the Roman government. Claim, he describes the popularity of John the Baptizer as a preacher. Uh, he was extremely popular. And the other Gospels actually say uh, there, there were, some of the leaders are worried about him because he said, look, all of Jerusalem is going out to him. I mean, the whole city is going out into the wilderness to listen to this guy preach and be baptized by him. His fame and popularity were actually noteworthy to both Herod, but also to the Sanhedrin. They're fascinated by John because they had not had a prophet speak to them in 400 years. They've been suffering in oppression for 400 years. So initially the Jewish opinion of John is favorable. And Jesus is pointing out, who do you think John is talking about? Who is John bearing witness to? Jesus himself. Where did John receive this? From God. He is bearing divine witness concerning Jesus. That was the, the reason for his popularity. They were willing to abide it for a time, but as you know, what happens to John? <laughs> so John is the forerunner. He is the one who has made straight the path, like Isaiah said would happen for Jesus to come. He's, he's, we often like to read the Gospels like Jesus is just beating up on the Jews. That's a really weird Western way of thinking about the Jews. And I could, because think of the, the fact that John himself is a Jew, you know, this is not some racial thing at all. As far as religion goes, he's typically speaking to people who have more common ground with him than not. He is trying to do what based on the end of verse 34. I say these things for what reason? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, in order that you might be saved. Sal in order that salvation... You are I'm saying this stuff for a purpose. All right, here, it's a fancy... I'm going to give you the English characters for this. This comes up a lot in John. It's... Last mark there. It's hina in Greek. And... Um, 
It's, it, it indicates purpose. It's a so that or a because or a, a for, you know, it sometimes it just comes across as for in English, but it is expressing purpose. Anytime you see a purpose clause in Jesus' speech, you better pay attention to it. Why is Jesus even talking to these people? Because he hates them and they're stupid? No. Because he loves them and he wants them to be saved. So, I don't like the way that even me myself as a younger person before digging deeper into this kind of had this idea that it's Jesus versus Jews in the gospels. Cause the, especially the other, the synoptics will often differentiate the groups. He'll say the scribes, they'll say the Pharisees, they'll say the Sadducees. They'll tell you what political party Jesus is dealing with. John doesn't. What does John call them? The Jews. And he lumps them all together. Right. Which is a little more confusing for us. <laughs> Until you recognize the fact that Jesus is actively working for their salvation, even in their opposition to him. He cares about them. He loves them just as he loves you. He's not beating them up, but he will oppose untruth for the purpose of bringing salvation to people. Now, he, and he's saying this right on the heels of healing a guy who'd been sick, lame, he, just completely worthless in their eyes. Yeah. Why did Jesus say quit sinning? What was he doing that was, that the fact that he didn't find out? He was, well, he's saying this. If you have been an invalid and you've been living this miserable life, yeah. uh, it actually could be worse if you were to go into judgment and damnation. You think your life was bad thus far? Now that you've been made whole, live in this forgiveness that I've just given you, restoring you to being a brand new person. Stay in that, or what faces you afterward is even worse. If you look back a little, just a little bit further, uh, an hour is coming where all in the, who are in the tombs will hear his voice and they'll come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done evil things to the resurrection of judgment. Yeah. I've been contemplating on that verse. Uh, it sounds like the Athanasian. That's Greek. where it comes from. Uh, yeah, where we kind of base our beliefs, I think, on uh, by grace are you saved through faith and mm -hmm. grace you deserve. Absolutely, out of your own. Yep. Why don't we uh, look at this one verse and say, well, it's works that get you into heaven. That's that's what many have done, and I think what what when it really comes down to it is what is what is the only good thing that a person can do? Believe. Faith. Yeah, it's absolutely true. By the time you get to Jesus' really big sermon in the upper room discourse, 14 through 17, uh, in 15, he starts talking about the vine and the branches. Uh, apart from me, you can do nothing. The only good things that Christians do are Jesus doing it through them. So here's the question. If the things that you're doing are not good, what does that say about your faith? It's not good either. <laughs> it's right. And what makes them good? And, and, and here's the tricky part. Can an atheist do good for their neighbor? Definitely. Yes, and they do. Is that going to save them? No, because they're being done by a sinful person. You can never purify anyone's motives down to the point that they're completely clean. Uh, even the, the famous new, new atheist Richard Dawkins, uh, kind, of a, kind of a hack philosopher, um, but he's been pushing atheism as a solution to all the world's problems. He argues that there's no such thing as altruism. That any good thing that anyone does for someone else always has a selfish motive. I don't disagree. He thinks he's got a gotcha on Christians on this, but guess who he doesn't have a gotcha on? Lutherans. <laughs> right? We have a low anthropology, and that is good news. The good news is that we are sinful in thought, word, and deed by what we do and by what we don't do. And we are not claiming a right to be able to please God by our own works, by our own, on our own merits. But however, once you are connected to the vine, Jesus, what comes out of you? Good, Good works. Things that are pleasing to God because it's God doing them. <laughs> on our own merits, nothing is good. But the difference... Uh, an atheist curing cancer is not going to save them. A Christian changing a poopy diaper is pleasing God. You know, think about that's it's apart from me, you can do nothing. 
you have no power to do anything, literally, he says. Not just unable, it's you can't do anything for God apart from Jesus. So, the question is here, you read, you read things that are unclear in light of things that are crystal clear. And all over the New Testament, and even the Old Testament, we would argue, it's justification by grace through faith. Then the result of that is the good. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life. Well, you can't do a good thing at all until you have faith in Christ. And then when you do, God is the one doing those good works through you. Uh, the way we've described it as Lutherans is a mask. That you're God's mask in your vocation. When you are incorporated into the body of Christ, you become a limb on Jesus' body. God is the one doing the work, right? It's just he, You're the instrument of blessing that God is using to bless the world. But that is where the language in the Athanasian Creed comes from. And it is also our understanding of this, why we continue to accept the Athanasian Creed. It's a complicated, confusing document for, and to use in modern language for sure. But when you consider the fact that the only good work is faith, and faith is actually given as a gift from God, then it starts to make a little bit more sense. Because those who don't do good works in God's view, not ours, in God's view, is because they have rejected Christ. That's the big difference. Um, yes? I was talking to this gal today, the, uh, this last week, Friday. She was talking about how she, she, I guess she's kind of like an interesting case or something. She wants to know Jesus, but she's been praying about it, and she sees all these people that are Christians around her, and they seem to have this connection with the Lord. And she said, I don't feel that connection with the Lord right now. And this other Christian and I were talking about that, you know, what, how, you know, like this revelation of, you know, oh, right. I'm, I'm Christ, you know. And I told her, it's just a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. It's not, he loves you no matter what. You don't have to be anything different. You just... Are his child. Yeah. And she goes, oh my goodness, she says, I, that makes so much sense. Because that's the faith part of it, yeah. is when you don't have the warm fuzzies. How many of us have the warm yeah, fuzzies about Jesus on a daily basis, all day, every day? They look for the sunlight. I don't. I'll be, I'll be the first one to tell you that. Especially the last few months. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, half, a third of the Psalms are laments. God, where are you? In other words... I don't feel God's presence at all. And in spite of that, I'm, that's, that's when I'm going to trust him, is when I don't have any feeling that he's there. That's what faith is. We in the Western world, especially in, Amer in America in particular, have developed a hyper-glorification of feelings in church. That you can judge the, the veracity of something based on how you feel about it. Not what, you, what is objectively true, but how it makes you feel. And that's why... Do you, do you yeah. think people have that thought that, oh, you know, I have to just have this excitement for him? <laughs> right. Well, I, I'll, the that, long story short is the, the movement called revivalism that came out of the so-called Second Great Awakening. Mm -hmm. Pre preachers like Charles Finney developed what they called the New Measures. Right. The New Measures was a response against academic theologians like us but especially against calvinism where they said well these people are just so bored here's what we're going to do we're going to whip them up into a frenzy of fear and anxiety first and they're going to be terrified for their salvation they're going to it's going to be fire and brimstone that's where that term comes from you're preaching this the you're scaring the hell out of them is what they're trying to do and then once they're terrified and they put a little bench up front for them to come sit when they're anxious like they're they don't know what they're going to do. Then you bring in the gospel and they make a decision to follow Jesus. It's all based on an anthropology that says human beings have the, the power to choose good or evil on their own. And all you've got to do is manipulate their emotions to get them to that point. Most Western Amer American Christianity is rooted in revivalism. And it's even infected areas of other older denominations. It began in Presbyterianism to a certain extent. It's Presbyterians fighting against their own tradition, but it spread like wildfire to the point that feelings, how you feel, is everything. Um, Mormons today will document, will the Mormon apologetic to one of their people struggling with doubts is, didn't you once feel the burning in the bosom? 
That is how you know, even if you don't feel it now, did you feel it once? That's how you know it's all true. If you ever had an emotional response to what we've said to you, it's true forever. That is dangerous. So how do we read the Bible and all of a sudden something gets the fact that's me all the time with reading devotion and just something I'm thinking about, boom, there it is in the script. Oh, just coincidence. No, 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 no. We don't want to dismiss don't it either. Feel, don't feel it. Oh, you're, you should feel it when you feel it, right? But you don't trust it. No. You don't, you, don't, you don't take the lack of feelings as a lack of truth, right. is what, I guess what I'm getting at. Because God hits me like a ton of bricks all the time like that. But in the moments where it's not there, is something not working? Or is God actually just stepping in when you need it? See, my mind goes back and forth, back yep. and forth, back and forth. Because the Lutheran sometimes are too intellectual, too factual, don't, it's like, don't have any feelings. All right, but that's that's also wrong. Yeah. Human beings, uh, being holistic in about looking at a human being, we are both cognitive and affective affective beings. Like meaning, you have feelings and you have thoughts. To pit them against each other is always a recipe for disaster. When you, you know what I'm saying? If feelings run the show, your church is going to be shallow and toxic because you're going to use manipulation more than anything else. If it's only cognitive and it's only about your thoughts and you never experience any emotion in church whatsoever, it is going to end up being dry and it's going to miss a lot of people. We need to integrate both. And that's what I, that, I don't know if you can tell, that's what I work really hard to do around here is to get your feelings and your thoughts, your mind and your heart, right? Hearts, heart, soul, mind, strength, we put it all together. God made the Adam a living being and it's all of him. Every element of him was created in God's own image even. Right. See, I say that a lot, but the music. Yes, we have great Lutheran intellectual hymns, 12 verses telling us God did this, 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 this. Yeah. that's good. Yeah. But it's sometimes it's, it just becomes, are you thinking about that? Are you internalizing it? Is it is something to At do a certain point, it? if it's too hard it's to something. sing, you're not even listening to the lyrics. Right. And just let's yeah. just praise the Lord. You know, sometimes I'm not, I'm not doing that all the time. Not right. Not only, but sometimes you want to both. If I, I, I look at it as your pastor. I look at it in terms of a diet. You know, can you eat just only one item for the rest of your life? No, you kind of have got to have a balanced diet. Um, I don't want you to check your brains at the door, but I also don't want you to be bored to tears. If you're not an academic theologian, right? Like, you know, there's only one of us around here, I think, that is that gets really fired up about deep study, you know? But you all, you're all great Bible study students. I'm not saying that, but you're not just going to, you don't want just the, dry, just the facts, man. It's not dragnet. So Jesus' whole work in this area is to engage the whole person. When he engages with a sick person for their salvation, it takes the form of healing. When he engages with someone asking questions like Nicodemus, it takes the form of argumentation, logic, rhetoric. He's, made, he's persuading here and demonstrating the truth. These are people right now in John 5, that the ones that he's talking to, as he says... Uh, 39, you investigate the scriptures for you think that in them you have eternal life. He's dealing with people that he knows care about God's word, right? He's not attacking them for that. He, but he is using where they are as a way to relate to them. So sometimes it is emotional. I was blind, but now I see or I couldn't walk. And he told me to carry my mat, you know, whatever form it takes. Jesus is out to engage the whole person. The pastoral task in the church is often to uh, read the person that you're dealing with. Uh, J.H.C. Fritz's 1932 pastoral theology that was used for years at the seminary says that the pastor has three books to read. The book of the flock, the book of the scriptures, and the book of the self. You've got to understand all three of those things to know what you're doing. Uh, or you're not effectively reaching and working. And you're not effectively ministering to people. Everybody's got a different need. Every congregation's got a different need, but every individual in the congregation is a different, unique person. And you have to know yourself. You One especially, size doesn't fit all. It does not. <laughs> that's absolutely right. And that's what's scary in the revivalist game. They're using manipulation tactics to make everybody the same person. And if you don't fit in, well, you're just you're not you're not spiritual. Well, you know. And the beauty of the law of gospel sermon. 
The right. law is going to hit some people that need to be hit, but the right. gospel is going to reach people who need that. Absolutely. Truth. The law gospel method of preaching, and it's not even a it's not even a sermon structure, but it is just it's two primary concerns, guarantees that the because the point of the sermon is to afflict the comfortable, right? Those who are self-secure in their sin and to comfort the afflicted. So if you weren't afflicted when you got here, I'm going to make sure you are, then I'm going to comfort you, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to manipulate your emotions. I'm going to let you consider your own vocation in light of God's law. That's the way the catechism does it. The table of duties, the part that everybody likes to skip, all those Bible verses, consider your own vocation in light of God's law. And you will find that, guess what? You're a sinner. But guess what? Jesus only came for sinners. So if you're, in sin, if you're a sinner, you're in good company because Jesus came for you. If you're not, then get out. Go play golf, right? You're wasting your time. I know, absolutely. If you're not willing to admit it, though, and if, if, people are not, if preachers are not preaching the, the fact that we are sinners and they're just trying to make everybody feel good, they're neglecting their duties too. Yeah. I've seen on the Marquis in front of churches, only sinners welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I say that a lot. It's only sinners welcome here. You know, we don't allow perfect people except Jesus. So that's, that's what is going on in this. He is dealing with people that they were intrigued by John, but they're not willing to come to him, even though that he's the thing that John was doing. John's whole ministry was pointed at Jesus. You were willing to rejoice in his life for a time, but I have that witness which is greater than that of John. And what is that you think he's talking about? John obviously is bearing divine testimony, but if Jesus himself has a testimony greater than that, what does he say it is? Taegra, Adenokin, the works that I have been given to bring to completion. Again, uh, I know I've got to beat you up with Greek once in a while because this word never gets translated right. I'm not writing in Greek characters, but this tetelestai, the word Jesus says from the cross when he dies. We always translate it what? It is finished. It is finished. Well, that's fine if you're just talking about like, here's the timeline, here it's end, tetelestai. It's not though. It is accomplished. What he's saying in that verse is, John says, I'm coming. I'm saying I'm here. Bingo. Bingo. And now the testimony that, now that John's testimony has gone, guess what the next testimony about Jesus is? It's to Telestai. What work is he going to bring to completion? And he says the word, it's completed when he does it. His death. Because again, once again, remember the backdrop for John is, the, is Exodus. The people that he's talking to, they think that they know God for what reason? Because their ancestors saw God on the mountain. They ate and drank in the presence of God. They did behold his form. And if you were to pull out the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, that is what is usually quoted in the New Testament, there's a lot of overlap in the language Jesus is using about God's form and voice with Exodus, uh, with the 72 elders on the mountain. Um, they did, the, the elders did see God, and they did hear God's voice. But you and standing right here in front of me, you haven't. Guess who has? Jesus. Where it says no one can see God and live, and yet it says that the elders... Yeah, they didn't die. That is a manifestation of Guess what? Drum roll, please. The person talking to them right now. How did God make his presence visible to them on the mountain? Christ, yeah, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Logos, the word of God. The one that was there in the burning bush, the one who was there on the mountaintop with them. They saw the God of Israel and did not die. That's because God himself has descended in, in taking the form of something that they can behold and not die. But it also means that after having all that blood splashed on them, they were purified from their sin. That's the reason that they could stand in God's presence and not die. They splat, remember they're throwing blood on all the people and they start prophesying and all that, then they go up and, and eat and drink. 
It's because that blood thrown on them is foreshadowing the blood that was going to be poured on them to stand in the presence of God again. Uh, everything in Exodus has got a, a greater fulfillment in mind. You know, what you're seeing is this, but if you pull that out of the way, you see what it was actually pointing toward. There's something happening there where, yes, momentarily they're forgiven so purely that they can stand in God's presence. But that's pointing to the day when that happens once and for all forever. Um, so he's saying, yeah, you think that you know God because your elders stood in front of God. But you don't recognize that that same form and voice that they saw and heard on the mountaintop is right here in front of your face. And you don't want it. <laughs> See, he's not against them. Why is he saying this stuff? Again, so that you might be saved. He's trying to save their butts, their souls, everything about them. But they are rejecting the very thing that John, who they liked, was talking about. They're rejecting the very one that their ancestors saw and, and ate and drank with on the mountain and the reason for which they think they know God better than anyone. So, you know, in Scripture it talks about husbands and wives and that the husband would be saved through the wife's belief. So uh, that's kind of the same affiliation. There's and what I call... Her, her, she's a Christian, so I'll be okay. Well, hormonal Lutherans. <laughs> There, there, there are three types of Lutherans. There are Lutherans who are born Lutheran. There are Lutherans who are converted on their own by seeking out a new church or through the testimony of another friend. Or there are hormonal Lutherans, type C, that marry into it. Yeah. <clears throat> She'll be saved, you know, through the... It isn't yeah, saying that, say that the wife's faith isn't what is doing the saving. It is that the wife's faith is going to transform that person given enough time oh, and yeah. patience. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. that's what vocation does in action. So right? Yeah. Patience and, and being together. If you're living as a Christian, something will eventually click. Yeah. You know? you don't Because you never know what that person believes in their heart yeah. either. So it's, it's a matter of the, the faith of a spouse rubbing off on someone else. But so anyway... The elders saw him on the mountain, but these guys standing there didn't. Who was the one standing there talking to him now? Jesus. The one who was on the mountain. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> the father who sent me as well has given witness concerning me. His voice you've never heard. When was his voice heard? In Jesus' lifetime. Baptism. At his baptism. John doesn't record that, but he knows that the other Gospels exist. People would know that the Father said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay? His voice you've never heard. His form you've never seen. The Father's form, that is. Nor do you have his word remaining in you because, because you do not believe in him whom he has sent. Me. This one. You do not believe in this one whom he has sent. He's pointing to himself. Um... They think that they knew the Bible because their ancestors knew the Bible. But in the case, many lifelong Lutherans. I know what the Bible says. I was raised Lutheran. Well, you actually got to open the thing once in a while, too. <laughs> Takes it one step further. The, the mountain, the word's not in them. And now here, you investigate the scriptures for you think that in them you have eternal life. Is that a, a valid assumption? Do we have eternal life in the scriptures? Fundamentalists will say yes. What do we think? Yeah, I'm being slippery here on purpose. Yes, you have life in the scriptures, but why? Because of, of Christ. Who gave him the scriptures? Well, who is the word of God? Jesus Christ. The person standing there talking to them is, is the word of God right? You can't have the Bible without the Jesus, okay? It doesn't work that way. He is the Word of God, who is the way that God has communicated with humanity all along. The second person of the Holy Trinity, the incarnate Logos here, Jesus. Yes, before he was incarnate, he was still the one speaking to them. He's the one who was in the burning bush, He's the one whose finger wrote on the wall in Daniel. He's the one who went to the camp of the Assyrians and slaughtered 250,000 of their soldiers overnight. 
the Malach Yahweh, the messenger of God, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, that's who is standing there talking to them. The fiery furnace, the fourth man in there, the one like a son of God, says the pagan, <laughs> right? This is who, Jesus is not some wimp, okay? He is, there is Israel's God who is in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he's there talking to them, but they don't recognize it because you don't get the Bible if you don't take Jesus. It all goes together. You investigate the scriptures for you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they, however, which give witness concerning me. In other words, how do you read the 39 books of the Old Testament? What are they about, says Jesus? They're about him. So, let's just consider for a moment the liberal, skeptical argument about who Jesus is for people that like Jesus but don't like Christianity. Jesus was a nice moral teacher. Jesus taught the same basic message as all the other world's religions. Which is what? Be nice. No burgers. Yeah, be nice to other people. Nowadays it's actually morphed into be tolerant. But it used to be be kind or be nice. Every world religion teaches us to be nice. And there's all these basic rules in common. And Jesus taught the same thing as all the other ones. No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's what C.S. Lewis called it. Love. So. True. But I'm just thinking of the claims of Jesus. If you actually read what Jesus says, did he teach what Muhammad teaches? There's nothing in common. He's saying you can't do anything to save your soul. And, other, and also, is he just, did he never claim to be God? That's been the, that was the nice 20th century skeptical argument against Christianity. Jesus never said he was God. If you read the whole New Testament, it never says Jesus is God. At least in his own words. That maybe Paul says that. But Jesus never says that he's God. Baloney, how many times does he call himself ego e me or ha'on? The one who is. In other words, the Greek form of Yahweh. Do they understand that? What the argument he's making? Yes, they did. The Jews tried to kill him with rocks when he says this stuff. So if you think they didn't understand his claim, that it wasn't clear to the original audience, you're fooling yourself. C.S. Lewis proposes what he calls the, what we call the Lewis, the Lewis tri trilemma. Not a dilemma, that's two options. A trilemma. You cannot have a neutral Jesus. Jesus is either one of three things based on his own words in the Gospels. He is either the, the Lord of heaven and earth and Israel's God in human flesh. He is a crazy person who thinks he is, like someone who has taken too many hits of LSD and thinks that he's a glass of orange juice. <laughs> or he is a deceptive, evil liar. You can't have it any one, you can't have it anything but those three, based on what he says. So is Jesus an evil, deceptive liar? No. Is Jesus a crazy person? No. Then what does he have to be? That was where Lewis got to after proving, trying to prove that Jesus was something else. He hated his Christian friends at Oxford who were always trying to talk about their Jesus. <coughs> you know, he's raised moderately Anglican. He's got, he's got this buddy, J.R.R. Tolkien and all his friends. You know, Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and all that. These are all these Christian professors at Oxford and he's just sick of them talking about Jesus. He thinks it's so medieval and superstitious so he's going to scientifically or historically as a, a professor of mythology prove that jesus is just a bunch of pious nonsense and he becomes the not, the primary proponent for the validity of jesus historical divinity the jesus divinity based on the, the testimony of history in england in the 20th century if not the world he, he set out to disprove it and so when he, when he comes to his conclusion, he's either crazy, evil, or he is who he says he is. You don't get to have a nice, neutral, moral teacher, hippie Jesus. You know, Jesus is in some hippie in a dress telling you to be nice. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh, the dread warrior of the Old Testament and the dread warrior of the, the coming again in glory, uh, who has 
voluntarily lowered himself in order to save you. Power is not, power is not best displayed in its exercise. Power is most effectively displayed in its restraint. If Jesus has this much power, only someone that powerful could voluntarily humble himself so low. This um, book I read uh, by one of the doctors was an ex-abortionist. He was saying it was the Christians that the love and the genuine love and, and patience that they shared with him that brought yep. him to faith. Yep. And he said it's just observing that they just didn't get the gospel. No, they because they're ca- they, we care about people. Yeah, that's why I've noticed the rhetoric has changed. Um, they were willing to tolerate our self-appointed label of pro-life until this year, and now the news media will no longer call you use the term pro-life. It is anti-abortion. They no longer permit us to have our own terminology. They are, we are now called anti-abortion, not pro-life. But we are not anti-abortion only. We are. People who rejoice over life, yeah. as President Harrison says. You know, we're not against it because we hate people, but because we love them. Yeah. And as Amy's uh, OB specialist, when Mark was going to be born, had his plaque on his wall that said, babies are such a wonderful way to start people. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. We're out of time for today, but uh, we will pick up another time. We will, I will not be here next week, so that's... Uh,